Hey there everybody and uh, welcome to this next journey. We're about to actually do a miniature model. I'm going to take you on this little uh, journey on uh, the process I take to building some of the miniature models within my room, uh, adding some of the techniques and, and hopefully you will learn something from it as well. Um, I'm going to explain different types of products. I'm going to explain different techniques I'm using to put this uh, model together. Um, I, I've got an area that I actually want to work on. I've got an idea for it and it's in the other room. So I'm going to show you. What I actually have done is I've decided to sit here and go, what would be the best use of this particular space? And I realized that I've got a ton of characters from the Star Wars Cantina that still need a place to go. And it seems like a lot of them are very fitting for the exterior of the Cantina. So one of the first things that I have to do when it comes to designing my own space is I need to take measurements. I need to know exactly what the height, the width and the depth is on the space I'm about to work on and build into the shelving size, etc. That's going to give you an indication of what you actually can physically do in proportion to what it is that you're, you're displaying. In this case, the 12 inch figures, I'm going to be displaying them uh, as, as uh, uh, in that scale. Now, into what I've chosen, this is right next door to the interior of my cantina scene. And the cantina scene, I took some effort and did this about a year ago, um, uh, putting in some LED lights, uh, a lot of scenic painting. And I do wanna show you how I kind of did that in this case, I'm actually going to be doing the exterior of the cantina. I have this dewback that I really want to display, and in one of the scenes of the exterior of the cantina, there is the dewback that is, in fact, in shot. I have to figure a way to make this all work and look kind of accurate as I possibly can, at the same time still give myself enough room and not force everything to be clamped in there. At the same time, I still do want to display these figures in such a way. So. My goal is to create this exterior of the Star Wars Cantina on Tatooine uh, within this space. Uh, there are things that I can and cannot do that I really would like to. I truly would love to design the uh, speeder here that is on the exterior of the cantina, but it's just way too big to fit into this space. So I have to make some hard choices on what I can and cannot do within this particular display setting because of the lack of space. As we go along, I'm going to also take you on the process of what type of materials that we're going to be using and, and techniques that I use that uh, can help make this look uh, kind of cool and fun. The idea is that it will be a desert scape flooring and uh, a very, very Tatooine-esque as well as a bit of shape forms. Uh, there's a junkyard space that's outside the front there, some sort of crashed spacecraft pieces, things like that, uh, that I also want to do as background for this. Uh, so that's going to be a big part of that there. I've got the dew back that I really, truly want to put in here as well. Uh, I want to put a couple of Imperial troops. It's supposed to be Empire occupied uh, uh, Tatooine at this point in time. So, uh, it's going to be important that those guys kind of make a make a, uh, a, a presence in this particular space. Uh, the goal here is that A, I have to clean. Yes, I, I have to clean. Uh, maybe we'll do a montage of cleaning because uh, it's going to get kind of boring soon. But I want to clean this area up and, uh, and uh, then start to measure all the uh, measurements and uh, figure out what I've got to work with. Uh, at that point, my goal would be to work on the flooring first and then work my way up from there as well. So uh, without further ado, I really wish I could snap my fingers and make it go. So I've got this all clean now um, and, and now it's time to take the measurements. So uh, you need with you a piece of paper, a pen, write down your dimensions and it helps to have a tape measure if you don't have a tape measure. You could use a ruler. And the measurement I've got on this, it's two feet deep. Always write down each of your dimensions as you go. It is 
four foot, 11 inches long. And the height is 19 and a quarter inches. Now, I want to give myself a little bit of room to be able to move these in. So I'm going to take these down about a quarter of an inch on the side and a quarter of an inch on the top. So the height here is going to be 19 inches instead of 19 and a quarter. And this allows me the freedom of being able to slide anything I build in here without it getting stuck or wedged in there. Uh, that's always a big concern uh, that you build something and then it just doesn't quite fit in your right space. So the important thing is that. So at that point, these are the dimensions that I've written down. And this is what I'm going to work off when I actually draw this up. My next stage at this point is I do intend to put down a piece of wood on the ground. Now, in the past, I've used foam core or cardboard, but in large, great, big spread out areas, I always find that foam core tends to warp and bend. It's very hard to keep flat. So if you can find yourself a very flat, thin piece of wood to work off of uh, to start with, then uh, that is a great place to start. If you decide you want to work directly on the surface itself, that's cool too. But in this case, when you're building some of the miniatures, it's nice to be able to take the floor out and work with it. So in this case, I'm going to be cutting a piece of wood that is the right size for the flooring. And I'm going to be starting with the floor because I'm going to be able to draw up all my dimensions and shapes on that. Um, yeah, so with that stage done, now it's time to start to figure out how this is going to fit in the space from the drawings and the visuals I've seen from the exterior of the cantina. And uh, yeah, so let's uh, move on to that stage. So as you can see here, I have my dimensions already drawn up. Uh, it is four foot 11 wide, two feet deep, which is the floor space and 19 inches high. This is a representation of the box that I'm gonna be working on and extending on. Uh, you can also see here, I have pulled off several references off the internet of what the exterior of the cantina looks like, as well as some high detail images in some books that I happen to have. Uh, some of these books uh, are available online. Uh, some of them are a little harder to get, but uh, usually there's something somewhere that's got some image and artwork and, and, and form of what's going on. And it's also great to see some of the extreme detail that are going on in some of these images. Uh, I like to get as precise with the images as I possibly can when I'm building these models. So it's nice to have extensive research to continue looking at this stuff here. Now, what I need to figure out next is what I can fit in this space. So this is the primary visual image of what I'm going to go for. I'm gonna go with the exterior wall of the cantina uh, this back wall, in the background, there's a dewback here. Now, unfortunately, I don't have that depth. So my dewback is going to be stepping forward from that background and probably sitting somewhere in here in the model. I'm probably going to have Luke and Ben and the droids wandering towards the cantina door. Uh, there's this great big piece of uh, junk, space junk that's here. Now, I don't want to be able to build something this big and take up as much space as I want to. I'm going to find ways of cheating the perspective on this, probably, in the space that I have. Otherwise, it will end up by taking up a huge area of space. Unfortunately, I'm not going to get the chance to build this speeder. Yes, it is a speeder. I don't know how it moves exactly. I would like to see that one day. Um, but the speeder, unfortunately, in 12-inch scale is just too big and it's probably gonna end up beyond the boundary of the model that I'm actually building. So unfortunately, the, the large speeder has to go in this particular case. Sometimes it's a matter of picking and choosing what you can and cannot fit in the space and make it aesthetically pleasing without overcrowding it uh, and without distorting what you're trying to do too much. So from here, I'm going to be figuring out from my floor plan, that I'm going to end up by doing something that is going to come off from my wall here, which is coming off from here. I want to have a little bit of wall that's going to extend back. I'm probably going to have the doorway 
which is this area here, somewhere about here towards the front of my model. I'm looking at it this way here. Uh, it's going to extend back and it's probably going to form the corner of where there's another door right here where these three Jawas are sitting in this space. So at this point, I've got the arch. I've got that. By the way, this happens to be a plan. It's a straight down point of view, trying to get an idea of the layout of everything. Now, in this image, our dewback is back here beyond the boundary of my wall. There is some visual back here. So I'm probably gonna end up by doing eventually some sort of a printout or a photocopy or something, a piece of art that's gonna go along the back here that's gonna represent this gap that's going on. It's just more extension of buildings and it goes on as a perspective. So I'm probably gonna paint that as a perspective, which is a depth, which allows me to actually put this stuff a little further, more open right there. So around here, we end up with this dish. Now, normally this dish is gonna come right out to here and take up that much space. I don't wanna lose this much space for a piece of architecture. So what I'm probably gonna do here is I'm gonna find a way that I can actually angle this dish, oval shape it, and maybe bring it off in, in, in this direction that is gonna fit here. And again, looking at it from a top view, it's got this, this weird shape that goes to it. And there's a few other little bits and pieces in front. I then have to also consider what is beyond this space. Now I'm looking at other images here and it looks like it goes off into the distance at this area. So what I'm probably gonna do is the same thing I did right here where I'm gonna have a background which has got some perspective. I'm probably gonna do the same thing along here, find a photocopy or an image that I can actually work with and, and place in the background there to extend that. That way I don't lose any space building out from here. So at this point, I'm probably gonna put a couple of figures across here. I'll be able to put my dew back beastie right about here. He's gonna take up the most space. There's gonna be a few Imperial troops around. Uh, I might end up by putting, only because I need to put it in here somewhere. Uh, I wanted to probably put Maul's speeder. Yeah, I know, wrong time period, but other things are gonna go here. A few more random characters wandering around. So you can see from my idea of how I'm gonna place this, I'm thinking of creating this space, this environment. Again, bird's eye view, this is kind of the area that you're gonna look at. So my next stage here is knowing that this is two feet long and four foot, 11 inches deep. I'm gonna end up by cutting a piece of wood that's gonna be my base that I'm gonna build up from. Um, from that base, I'm gonna put some markings, figure out where I wanna start my walls on this particular piece of board and also texture the ground uh, that is gonna have this kind of very sand, dirty texture. It's not just gonna be painting it flat. I'm gonna add some techniques to the floor to make it and build it up. So that's the next part of this journey from here. So from here, let's, uh, I'm gonna go cut the piece of wood. So I found a piece of hard wood. I ended up by cutting it out. It was a scrap piece of wood. Uh, you can always go to a place like Home Depot and Lowe's, uh, if you're in America, at least in the States. Uh, they do actually cut the wood to a specific size if you decide you want to do that. In this case, I found a piece of scrap wood lying around and uh, it was the right size. And I cut the dimensions, which is two feet long by four foot, 11 inches wide. I left myself the quarter of an inch space on the side so this piece will slip in. Now this is going to end up by being, as I was saying, the ground of the actual dirt. Uh, but I do want to also figure out from this where the alignment of my building goes. Now, I don't want to start up half, hard way against the edge here. I do want to have a little bit of thickness to some of these walls. And the walls in the actual cantina entrance are quite thick. And in this particular case, I think I'm going to come off around about probably four inches off from the back here. 
The first thing we're going to do is measure off four inches at the front and towards the back and then draw a straight line. So I'm going to draw this straight line. This is going to allow me to just start to justify the depth and the distance that I've got. Now, because I've only got two feet and this is probably much more scaled longer, I've got to figure out and just kind of eye up what I feel I want to do here. So in the next case here, a great deal of it is gut instinct and, and, and visual eye, uh, and definitely taking some measurements into account. Sometimes you can actually make a few mistakes. I usually draw it all down in pencil first, and when I find my final lines that I like the best, I then seal them with the black marker, and that allows me to make sure I've got the accurate lines that I want to keep ready to go for when I build these walls up from around this setting here. So, in the case of the length of this, this is one solid length of wall all the way down, uh, which goes all the way down to here, and then there's the back where these Jawas sit here. Now remember, these are all in 12 inch scale, and uh, I actually want to consider the fact that I can actually fit three Jawas in here. So what I'm going to do is get some Jawas to help us. So I have here three helpful Jawas that are going to be standing here just to give me an idea of space and dimension. Look at these guys, aren't they cute? They're adorable. And they roughly sit about this kind of space apart in my drawing. And I'm using them as a kind of a scale that I want to build this wall at. So I look at where they're at, I try to figure out where this wall would come off from here. It looks like it comes off around about here kind of thing. Now, I don't want to push too much space of what I'm building into the setting here. And since it's a very thin wall uh, with only a single door there with not a lot of depth, I think I'm going to bring it out two inches from the back here. So I'm going to measure out two inches and then I'm going to measure it the other side, two inches draw myself a straight line across here so at this point in time I actually now have my back wall and my entire side wall here now I need to figure out there's this great big arch and then there's a doorway inside the arch now I've measured this depth from the back here to here at four inches long and now I'm going to probably mark it at the halfway point. So I'm going to put another line over here at two inches and two inches. And now I'm going to figure out, go from here. I think I'm going to, a lot of this, as I said, is trying to figure out how big these spaces are. If a character and a figure is this big, I'm going to go get Ben Kenobi for this. So to help you figure out the scale with the actual 12 inch figures, I'm going to pull out both Luke and Ben Kenobi. These guys are going to be a nice scale to help me figure out what I want to do with this wall. Luke and Ben walk into a bar. Boom, boom. So these guys are this size here. I'm looking at the size of my archway. And I know I need to come in roughly about here. I don't want to make this door too small, so I'm going to bring it to roughly about here. In this case, I'm eyeing it up, seeing what works best. So I measure along, it seems like I've got three inches here, so I'm going to put a straight line, mark it up along there. It looks like I've got 13 inches from there to there. I'm going to draw my straight line from there. This is now going to be my archway, and in the back of that is a door itself. So this door is centered to this. What I need to do is find the center mark. So if this was 13 inches, I'm going to now bring it to six and a half. And my door itself, looking at some of the more detailed images here, Looks pretty wide. I'm going to go with a door that's around about five inches wide. 
And so I'm going to mark it at two and a half and five from the center. It's going to be my centered door. That should be about right in the scale, yeah. That's going to be probably about 14 inches tall. No, maybe tall. That might be about 16 inches tall. My arch is going to be that big. Okay. So normally this is going to be much wider than what we've got in the model. Unfortunately, I've only got so much space. So I'm going to form my shape of my arch. It's going to be a little bit more oval shape to fit in where I need it to go. But I think it's going to work. My Jawas seem to have a nice little area back here to sit in front of that door. I'm going to move these guys out of the way now. And I'm going to put in their door. Now there's actually two parts to this as well. This has a little incline that I'm going to mark it around about a foot back. Before I put in the door. And this actually starts and goes pretty close to the edge here. And it looks like we've got a few inches there, so I'm going to say about three inches. So there is a second archway that's more of a square arch that lives here. There's a door in the middle there. Uh, it's 11 inches wide, so I'm going to make this five and a half. It's a pretty big door too. So I'm going to go with a five inch door here. So I've laid myself a layout of where I'm going to build up my foam core walls. Now, a lot of this, I've done this for so many years. I just basically have taken my time, figured out what I need to do. It's up to you to take your own time, sit there, measure on what you feel looks best and what feels accurate and within scale to what you're doing. Since you actually have to fit it in a certain space, you have to scale down a little bit. Uh, on whatever it is that you are building. In this particular case, this cantina wall is going to fit in here. And I think it's going to be quite nicely uh, situated. It hasn't come out too far into my workspace of where I want to be able to display action figures. Uh, I have to remember I've got a great big dewback, which is a big uh, beastie guy that sits about here somewhere. So he's going to take up a big chunk of this space. But I'm going to have a few Imperial troops over here. I'm going to have Ben and Obi and uh, Luke Skywalker kind of moving into the cantina here. I'll put down a few Jawas sitting on the ground and everything over here. Um, yeah. So now the next stage of this, let's get rid of these guys for a minute here. So since I've got this part, like, uh, the good thing is this is a relatively simple model too. Uh, there's not a lot to this and not a lot of complexity. So it's going to be an easy build and an easy walkthrough that uh, is done. If you do have any questions, though, you can always comment below. I'm always happy to respond to your questions and uh, let you know what uh, let you know what uh, uh, thoughts I have on certain materials, products, and uh, any uh, any design situations or causes that you've got there. Okay, um, so. At this point, I know I've got this big circular piece that uh, needs to fit on this side. There's also some rough bits of junk that are in the way. And I'm going to just loosely map this in place of how far out I really truly want it to go and how I want it to work. And I'm thinking I'm going to have this big circular disc come out no further than here with a bit of an angle that goes to about there. There's also a big slab of something debris concrete that's about here it looks like there's a, a a round thing that sits about here that i want to reproduce uh there is a lot of sand buildup that's in here and a few bits of metal that are also in here too this is this great big circular piece and this is going to be something i'm going to map into here and build and piece into this corner here on the angle now I was talking about wanting to do along the back here, a piece of the sky, some background settings, all that. So I eventually I'm going to take a measurement from here to this point here and try to figure out what it is I want to do. That might be a series of printouts. Uh, it might be a painting. I might sit there and actually paint a backdrop. A backdrop. 
um, but you can also go to uh, um, a uh, photocopy store and enlarge up an image and even print it out. That can get a little bit costly. Uh, there are other cheaper ways around it, um, depending on your budget. Uh, yeah, and we're going to do the same over here. This is going to be in the continuation of some of the town and some of the sky that goes on in this space. Now, the next stage of this and the last important stage before we go on to working on the floor and adding texture to it is get these guys out of the way. I need to try to figure out the passage of where figures are moving. I want to be able to build up some of the dirt and the ground a little bit so it's not just a flat piece of board. But I also don't want to build it up in areas where I want to stand my figures where they would be walking through. I do want to keep some areas flat as I possibly can so that it doesn't inhibit the ability of these characters and these figures to stand in their place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to map out loose areas that I want to keep flat by just simply drawing an area. Now, I know the path around the canteen of entranceway, I want to keep it pretty flat and open, but I don't mind building up a little bit as foreground and I can build up a little bit here. I know I have to put a few Jawas in this area here, so I want to keep it flat here. Now my Jubak is pretty big and he can handle a bit of uh, shapes under his feet, so I'm not too worried about the middle here, but I do want to put a couple of Stormtroopers and a couple of other other things going on in this area. So I'm going to keep this area here also open for a flat area. And just for the heck of it, because I haven't figured out where I'm putting everybody yet, I'm going to keep a small area that's in here as well open. So I've got four areas here, 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 and here that I initially want to keep open for characters to be able to stand them without them having anything under their feet that's going to obscure them and tip them over and make them fall over all the time. At that point, I'm going to go back in. As I said, I had the black marker there. And I'm going to black marker off my areas that I actually am going to build into. And these are all going to be built up as walls. Just so I know what I don't want to get covered with other stuff on the ground. I also don't want to go into these areas with any of the dirt I'm putting on the floor. Otherwise it becomes an obstacle underneath what I'm building. So I really want to make sure when I build up dirt around these areas that I keep myself a little bit of space free that I can glue this down and attach it to the base of the floor first. Uh, and then later in, I can go up and build up sand on the edges of the buildings if I want to go that direction. So the entrance to my cantina is over here. The Jawas entrance piece is over here. And this is a bit of debris. This is going to be an area for a big piece of space junk. And I'm going to keep the circular areas somewhat clear. This is also going to be a space for a circular piece of shape. I want to keep this area clear. And this area. And this area here. Now this applies for any type of model that you want to build. If you're going to build 
the bridge of a Star Destroyer, you're going to want to map out your spaces. If you want to build a decking and flooring in the Death Star, you're also going to want to map out your spaces. Uh, it doesn't really matter if it's that. It could be a Harry Potter scene if you want to actually do the castle floors. You need to figure out how far out your walls and any pillars come. So you've got these options of that are limited to the space that you've got to build within, but proportion is a big thing. And being able to make sure that your figure height is going to acquire uh, the space to make these work is a big part of it. It's just something to be aware of when you're putting this all together. So the one last thing I'm doing is making sure that the piece I've got cut is in fact going to fit evenly into my space, which it does, which means this is uh, this is uh, beginning to go. Awesome. Okay, so now I know that it all fits in place, um, and I'm actually ready to do the first stage of uh, adding texture to this ground. So what I happen to have here is spackle. Uh, what I find is that spackle adds a really nice texture. You're able to mold it, it gives it time to set. Uh, also, spackle these days has a slight tendency to have a certain amount of flex to it, which means that when you're moving something like this around, it can control, hold the flex without actually breaking and cracking up. So uh, I do tend to use uh, a, a spackle. You can get some cheap ones out there. Uh, I happen to go with the dry decks, uh, dry indicator uh, spackle because you put it on, it comes on pink. When it's dry, it's white. That way you know and you can visually see that it's, that it's actually dry. Now, the thing is, this is a little bit more expensive than your regular spackle, but uh, you've got choices out there and they all work all the same. Uh, so I'm going to show you some of these techniques. Some of the other things you're going to need with this is going to be something to actually attach the spackle to. Um, a putty knife will work. Uh, uh, I'm going to use a stick because it gives me a chance to scoop out and put in large areas in, in, in spaces with. Uh, a cleaning rag is also a good thing to have, as well as a paintbrush. And the paintbrush is going to show you a certain technique that allows me to do some things. Also, if you do happen to have anything like uh, a small knife or something, you can actually add other forms of layer, which I can show you in more detail as we go along. Looking back at my floor images, it's relatively flat on Tatooine, but there is a sand buildup that builds up around the edges of buildings. Uh, I assume all those dust storms tend to blow into the corners of things. So for the most part, I'm going to keep most of the center relatively flat. I do want to have a little bit of ground texture, so I'm going to add a few raised areas here and there um, that at least add a bit more depth to what I'm trying to do. Uh, as I raise these areas, I then want to blend them down into a flatter surface area. So when I go to work with these areas that I want to keep flat without anything in the way of characters and figures standing on it, um, that they stay flat enough and they don't become an obstacle. So at this point in time, I'm going to clear these guys off from here. I'm going to open up my spackle. Move some of this stuff out of the way. And I'm going to start applying. Now you can see I'm putting it on, trying to get it blended down pretty heavy on the on the floor there. I'm trying to get a, a somewhat evenish coat over most of this area. It doesn't have to cover everything, but I do find that it helps to get a general coverage over most of the surface. Now I do tend to work in areas. I'll work on a section and then work my way out. Usually I start in the middle of what I'm working on and then start to build my way out from the center. But as I go, even though I've got dry time with this, it's, it's good to just kind of start to formulate how this is going to look. So if you're not too sure, uh, experiment in an area while it's still wet. If it doesn't work, you can always pick it up, scrape it out, and, uh, and try again while it's still wet.
I want to have some of these really raw, rough edges around here. It adds for great leveling and, and uh, texture within the form. And as you can see, I'm not getting too high. It's just really keeping it at a flat, fairly flat stage. So, at this point, <clears throat> I usually go back in once I'm happy with the general cover. And I use a cheap wooden uh, paintbrush. Uh, wood chip paintbrush and I start to what's called stipple it and as I hit down onto it I have this very rough texture that allows it to feel a little bit more sand like so I'm going to work on that texture from the center and work my way out if I play around with these edges here I can come in from the side and create these little nice little sand areas that are built up. Again, not getting too tall, too high with any of this. It's just really just trying to keep a ground texture. Uh, this is actually gonna be the first layer and a second layer, especially over these flat areas that are here, I'm gonna add another very thin sand layer of something very different. And I'll show you that once it all dries out. So as to the area, you can see what I've done here. And I've covered the whole area with the texture of the paintbrush. Um, it's left me this nice surface um, that is very coarse, very rough, and uh, is also easy to paint. I actually like to have uh, the occasional clay tool. It uh, is a wooden clay tool, allows you to sculpt and shape clay. It's great for this sort of thing. If I want to go back, and create a few creases and a few cracks in the dirt, I can actually go back in and add some extra level of, of, of forms and, and, and cracks that you couldn't normally get with a paintbrush or a stick. But it does allow me to go in, add these little cracks, you come back in again very lightly with the paintbrush and you just stipple it once again and it leaves you these little cracks, which are great when you paint over them. Uh, you get a chance to put some dark layers in there and it kind of reads nicely from a distance. So you don't do it too often. You don't want to make the, feel, the ground feel like it's way too cracked, unless that's what you're looking for, of course. Uh, but it is a very, very easy, very easy method. Um, cracks always kind of split and divide off into different parts and uh, and uh, yeah, so that's part of this. A few more here. At this point, I'm happy with this area right now. I've got it where it starts to bleed into not a lot going on here, but I still want to stand my figures up here in these flat areas. So I'm going to continue and expand this out and continue working on the whole thing. Now you can also see here, as I said, with this particular um, uh, spackling, it actually starts off pink and then it dries white. And when it dries white, I know it's completely dry all the way through. And uh, that means that I know when it's time to actually start to paint it. Now, as I had mentioned before, there's going to be areas here where I'm going to want to build up against other objects. I'm going to come just short of these for the moment. Keep it clear because I still want to be able to place something flat on the surface. Um, and uh, when I actually build these objects, I'm going to come back in with some more spackle and build it up around these objects. But I can't really put that in until I know a how big and what type of object, whether it's a wall or a structure, it's going to be. And I want it to make it feel like natural that the sand has built up on the edges of of the dirt, of the uh, uh, structures that are around the buildings and all that sort of stuff. So if you have any questions, always please feel free to comment. Um, there's no right and wrong way to doing all this. There's just uh, amounts of experimentation. Uh, I'm just showing you what I've found and works the best. Um, 
and try to at least explain some of the cheaper products that are out there that you can use. Again, you can get speckle pretty cheap uh, in uh, various sources. It depends on how much you need to cover too. Um, now, if I was doing this speckle on the ground on large sheets of foam core or something like that, um, it does tend to buckle in large flat surfaces. So whenever I do my walls, and you'll see that in a future video, I end up by building some extra support frame behind the walls um, so that the moisture from the spackle does not actually um, uh, end up by damaging the foam core and making it bend when you don't want it to bend and twist and warp. And back to a bit more stippling. Uh, stippling is in fact a painting term, which is a certain technique. In this case, it works the exact same way with trying to create this texture I'm looking for in my desert floor. Now the desert floor is going to be different slightly from my walls themselves. And again, when we get to when we get to building the section of the desert walls, I will uh, explain that a little more in detail as to how I'm going to make that work. I'm going to add a few more cracks back here. And the cool thing is there's an area that you don't like or it's too thick. You can come back over very easily, scrape it back up while it's still wet and uh, re-put it down again and uh, remold it while it's still wet. Once it's dry though, it becomes much harder to actually alter and change. So you have to give yourself an hour or so of being really accurate what you want to do because what you finally do do is going to be ha, do do. Uh, what you finally do do is going to end up by being your final result in all this. Now, this is along the front of my actual stage setting. Um, I am going to build this up a little bit higher at the front here. It just adds a nice little bit of depth uh, in the foreground uh, for the ground itself. So there'll be areas are going to build up a little bit higher. Uh, they will take a little bit longer to dry, but uh, the effect is usually well worth it. So it depends on how creative you want to get with your model. Uh, sometimes it doesn't always, you don't get it always right the first time. And you can go back over and add more and more layers in the future if you decide you want to add more. You can always add to this once it's dry. It's just much harder to take it away once it is dry. This thicker area also allows you to go back much deeper on any inclines and, and textures that you want to create uh, with your knife too. One cool thing is you can actually push it on the side and build up these little wave points. It actually works in a couple of areas. Then you flatten it down so you get another extra layer of uh, texture on top. It's really up to you. It's, it's, it's just experimenting with the paintbrush and using these basic techniques and eventually you're going to find some cool things and cool stuff you can do. It's really up to your imagination uh, how this is all goes together. Um, it helps to have some reference images and artwork, but uh, at the end of the day, it's your gut instinct of what you want to try to show, show off and uh, display within uh, your miniature model. Sometimes it gets a little bit uh, thick there. Sometimes you can use your thumb too. Sometimes that uh, helps to bring in a nice clean edge to the ground level. It doesn't all have to be hard edges to the ground. Sometimes a soft edge also looks nice. And as you can see here, I've got it relatively high up here, this is probably about a quarter inch high that goes down to the floor level of that. And these circles are roughly guidelines. They're not exactly a exact menu of where you want to stick to. It's just to show you that you roughly want to keep an area free of any 
extra texture. I do know I'm going to put in here a, a flat area of, of sky and a bit of background buildings on this side here. So I definitely want to keep it clean along this edge. And this is the kind of project that can take a couple of days to put together. Uh, it's really about the dry time. Some things have to dry, whether it is the um, texture of the spackle that you're using or the paint itself. Uh, now during the dry time, that's when I usually will start measuring up other things I want to work with, like the buildings and the other structures, making sure I've got all that down. Um, but uh, you do have to have patience with the paint to dry and you do have to have patience for the spackle to dry. So don't think you can try to get it all done in a single day. In this case, spackle does take a little bit of time, but it's well worth the wait if you do it properly. Uh, you end up with a, a final result that you're very happy with and um, and you also get to take time and care as each stage goes forward uh, doing exactly what you want to try to create. Now I usually do pick up a cheap paintbrush because these guys tend to uh, get damaged pretty quickly. Um, so don't, uh, don't go buying a very expensive paintbrush. This is just a two inch wood chip brush that you would normally get from a place like uh, Home Depot or Lowe's, which is uh, over in the States here, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, if they get too destroyed, there's no great loss and no great expense. These, these little brushes, the two inch brushes, you can usually get for like a dollar fifty. Uh, so again, it's really worth it. I also like painting with these brushes again. Uh, they're, they're, they're easy to cover, they, they tend to go well on some of the miniature models, um, uh, at least with all the base coat. Then I'm going to get finer brushes as we actually uh, get closer to doing any detail and, and line work that need to be done on the, mo the miniature model. I have, a, I have a model I want to build, which is the interior of the Star Destroyer bridge. And uh, I've got the setup they're already ready to kind of build um, but it's going to involve a lot more cardboard a lot more uh, clean edges there's nothing going to be organic about the bridge so that'll be something that I'm going to do in a future time as well if you're interested in checking it out and again depending on the size of the area you can end up using quite a bit of the spackle uh, in this case, I've already used it. I've, I've, I've worked on uh, both my interior cantina scene using this and the floor of my sand crawler scene that uh, I had built originally years and years ago. Um, but I built that out of rough corrugated cardboard. Um, over a uh, holiday weekend and there's a part of me that wants to go back someday and do a complete rebuild of my 12 inch sand crawler and although i'm kind of happy with what i've got already it's uh it's getting old it's moved locations a few times and there are parts of it that are starting to fall apart and there are things i definitely know now i could do better on this sand crawler model so uh, at some point in the future i'm probably going to end up by uh jumping into that as well so right now right in front of this cantina it's a well-traveled path i'm not going to go terribly heavy i'm going to make it a very very thin layer uh, that goes through here it doesn't need to be heavy now it's cool to have these little rough patches of, of, of little spitball shapes. They look like little tiny stones and rocks and, and, and if you hit it light enough, it can blend in, but still form some nice little shapes. So at this moment in time, this is a great first pass for my first layer of texture that I'm going to be doing on the ground. 
uh, it will take a, a good uh, good time to dry, definitely several hours. Chances are I'm going to pick up on this later this afternoon and uh, go into stage two of this, which is adding a much finer texture to these very flat areas. These flat areas uh, definitely can't stay flat. They look a little strange if you don't do something with them. So I have another very thinner, lighter kind of uh, wall sealing texture that I'm going to end up by using for this. Uh, so um, uh, that will be the next stage of the technique. Now, as quick as a snap of the finger, we'll be right back. I really wish I could snap my fingers. So the texture is nice and dry and firm, and uh, I am ready to do the next stage of this layer. Um, I happen to have here a wall sealing tile texture and uh, I usually will mix something in uh, uh, that's got some sort of grit, some dirt to it. And this tends to work the best. It is a little bit expensive. It's around about $20 for a box. Um, depends on how much you're doing. There's probably small spray cans and that sort of stuff too. But it has a sand grit to it. A very cheap way to do this is if you have uh, some paint, the final paint that you want to use uh, as a base, you can actually mix a little bit of sand in with it. Uh, make sure you mix a little bit of water as well. Give it a bit of a looseness to it, and that'll create the sand uh, grit that I'm looking for, that you're looking for as well. Um, and uh, it just adds that little bit extra on these flat surface areas that are extremely too flat. Uh, when you paint them, you'll notice the difference uh, with this texture. So what I do is I have myself a plastic container. I uh, scoop out. Don't need a lot, just enough to kind of start up. And I add a little bit of water, make sure I've got a stirring stick. Bit of water, just add it very slowly. You're trying to get a paste out of it. Um, a paste that will allow you to uh, brush it on with a brush. And it takes a little bit of mixing. You want to actually get right in there. This stuff will dry relatively quickly, probably in about like 15 or 20 minutes. So you do want to actually get in there pretty quickly when you get it mixed and be ready to start pasting it together. Um, but yeah, uh, right now it's very lumpy. It just needs a good, good little bit of breaking down and, uh, and uh, mixing up. It's almost like a very fine plaster of Paris. So when you've got this milky-like substance ready, then it allows you to go through and then you can actually start to paint it on. And I go back into the flat areas and I do the same thing. I stipple it in there. In some cases, I don't mind going over parts of my other texture. But in other areas, I'm going to keep large areas that have got this great little detail free. Uh, my goal there is that it adds two different and three different types of textures. One on the flat surface, a little bit of this texture on the rough surface, and then you leave some of the rough surface open that you can actually see the natural roughness that you had when you first started. I don't want to paint into my little lined up areas here. I still want to keep that pretty flat uh, for my model work because I want to be able to have a nice clean edge when I go to put my glue on there and glue it down on the on the piece. Now this stuff does dry and keep its shape so you can go on relatively thin still create some shapes and it still holds that form that you're that you're attaching you're creating on there with the paintbrush i'm getting close to finishing uh it looks like i made just enough up if you need to make a little bit more just do it in small doses afterwards uh, a little bit does go a long way you'll find and uh once you actually uh but this set, then uh, it is actually then time for being able to put down your first layer of paint. So that will be the next stage. Um, look at that, exactly just enough. So I've covered everything I want to cover with this. And um, at this point, it is just a matter of letting it dry. 
So there you have it. It's nicely evenly covered and I need to let this dry. It's probably going to dry in about 20-25 minutes time. Uh, so at this point in time I realize that my next stage is painting and I am going to actually go out to the Home Depot store or Lowe's, see what kind of mist tints that they happen to have. But basically they mix up all these paints and people either don't pick them up or they end up by being the wrong color slightly. So what do they do with them? They sell them at a great discount price. And that's usually where I get a lot of my mixture of my paints from. You can find some great earth tones, you can find some great colors. Uh, and, and sometimes you can get a whole quart for like $2. You can get the little tiny sample kits for like 50 cents. Uh, so you're really lucky. You can go buy every week from your local stores and check it out. All right, so I've been to Home Depot and I've been to Lowe's and I've checked around for some paints and the color ranges that I'm looking for to be able to paint my uh, ground landscape. And I found a few nice colors that I actually like. Uh, some of them are going to be ones I'm going to mix in later, end up by creating slightly warmer tones for the building fronts, which have a slightly more warmer tone to them. Um, and uh, I found myself some dark colors in the brown tones, which are also going to be useful for some later tips I'm going to show you on this. So at this point in time, I'm going to start off with the two primary colors. Uh, I was lucky enough to pick up these guys at Home Depot for only $2 a quart. Uh, and again, it's all mist tints. Um, and uh, as long as they're all water-based, uh, water they, uh, they work really well for this sort of stuff. Um, all these little tiny guys, they're actually around about 50 cents each. And again, uh, all these are just mist tints. So if you're looking for some cheap paints, always check out Home Depot or Lowe's and every once in a while you'll find some different colors, build up a small collection of paints and, uh, and you've got all that for working with all your miniature models. At this point in time, everything is all dry and I am about to start my first base color. Now the base color is the color you're going to put down first uh, because you're going to build a few layers up. It's not just one layer of paint that goes on this. Now, when I start with my base color, I'm always going to usually start with the darker color. I want this dark color to seep into all the nooks and crannies of all the little shapes and textures. Um, because when I later go over with a lighter color and dry brush over the top, it allows all those surface areas to be highlighted and all the deeper areas to be left in the shadow from this wash or from this particular paint here. So um, for the moment, I'm going to put this light guy aside and I'm going to use my darker tone color, which is going to be my base color. Now, I always get paint all over me, so uh, I usually end up by putting on some sort of a paint shirt or something like that. Um, if you do uh, do it inside the house, make sure you put something on the ground because there's a chance you can get paint all over the place. So I'm painting this just regular house paint and I start off and because of the texture, I do lots of little swirls into my groundscape. That way I can get into all those little areas, all those corners, all that sort of stuff. And I'm coming in pretty heavy too. Now I don't want to really necessarily paint over the top of my gridded area because I do want to be able to see that I still haven't made those marks. So I'm going to paint just shy of. I did say at the beginning when I put this texture down, I'm eventually going to build it up against the walls and uh, make it look like the sand is built up in corners. So at this point, uh, it is really not worth uh, um, painting over those areas yet. And later when I've built the walls, I'm going to actually put all that in place. Sometimes it helps to do a little bit of stippling, getting all those hard areas to reach. So a fun fact, I was walking around one day recently and someone stopped me in the street. I was wearing one of my work shirts and uh, they said to me, oh my God, where did you get that designer label shirt? And I said, what do you mean designer label? She said, well, that looks like a designer label shirt. I was really, really shocked. It was like, seriously? I mean, people would pay actual money for this kind of paint shirt. And they said, yeah, yeah, it looks amazing. And I was like, wow, well, that's kind of cool. Uh, but 
you really don't want my old shirt. It's, you know, it's old, it's all uncomfortable, it's all crusty, that sort of stuff. And they said, oh, that's the kind of money that we actually would pay you for. It's like, oh, wow, okay, that's cool. Well, I passed up on their offer because it was my paint shirt and it probably wasn't kind of hygienically clean. And anyway, I thought about it. I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. I've got about 30 or 40 of these shirts sitting there. I can't on getting them dirty. I have no idea why I just keep on getting these things dirty all the time, but it tends to happen. I do want to hit along the front edge because I'm going to see this front edge. I do want to make sure that is one of the areas that get hit with my paintbrush uh, all the way along the front there. Okay, so you can see here that the first base color is down and it's going to have some time to dry uh, and set and it is darker as I mentioned before, darker than the original lighter tone that goes on top and again you'll see that texture and that reason why when I go to the next level. So bear with us, let this dry and we'll be back in a snap. Okay, so the first layer has dried and uh, everything looks good. It's gone deep into the cresses where I wanted it to go. Now, the second stage uh, is going to involve the lighter color paint and it's going to involve a piece of cardboard or a block of wood. So what I'm going to do is open up my paint can. This lighter color is my final sand color. And this is something that you need to do. It's a certain technique, uh, which is called dry brushing. Now dry brushing is basically uh, allowing as much of the paint, the wet paint off the brush itself. So I usually get rid of some of my excess paint on the wood where I'm left with just a loose little bit of paint on the edge. I'm very, very lightly and then gonna end up by scraping over the top of my desert. Let's move some of this out of the way. And I am dry brushing, so I get rid of access and I dry brush. So if you look carefully, you can see that everything here, uh, all the dark color is staying in the bottom parts of all the cracks and crevices and the light color is in fact hitting the surface and I've got this mixture blend between the light on the surface and the dark creating a little bit of shadow underneath it so going back adding more paint in and you just keep on going now usually you can actually go around do little swirls do little crosses yeah with your brush you don't have to go straight back and forth if you go straight and back and forth you create a whole series of streaks. You don't want to do that. You want the sand to feel like it's been blowing all over the place. So I'm going to show you, for example, if I do this back and forth here, these brush strokes look very much like brush strokes. But if I actually come in and I'm going left and right and, and turning my wrist, I actually get a much softer edge to everything so we don't see those brush strokes anymore. So that's kind of an important style and technique of adding this dry brushing on. At that point, you take the dry brushing all the way through. Now, just to show you a difference here, this is an unpainted area. This is where one of my models is going to sit, a piece of scrap. If I paint over the top of this, it kind of reads as very flat and it looks kind of weird for the model. Good thing is we're going to be hiding that area but you can see the difference between painting on a flat area surface and painting over the top of your texture. Now, this is actually going to be the second of a few, several layers. Uh, I'm gonna end up by going over this with one more layer as an additional highlight to help break apart some of the overall flatness that's going on with the second layer. And then I'm gonna be doing a whole pile of washes which are going to be additional areas that are going to help kind of create texture and depth within all the cracks and crevices. This actually is a pretty quick layer to get through. Now it's really important 
that your bottom layer is completely dry. If you don't let your bottom layer dry out completely, what will happen is uh, it'll blend in with that color, with the top surface color, and uh, and then it kind of makes this weird bleeding and it doesn't work very well. Uh, it's nice, it's better off having completely separated dry areas, to, surface areas to cover. Now, if I went on too heavy with this paint, it would seep into the bottom areas and you would not see any of the dark color pushing through. And that's what you're trying to avoid. So keeping it nice and light, almost like you're dancing over the top of your surface area, very lightly. And the idea is that you cover the entire area, keep an eye out, see if there's any areas that seem a little bit too streaky and uh, uh, go in and soften those edges so they don't feel like they're a paintbrush mark going on there. And you can see in here some of those cracks that I created I've uh, got them there. They're going to be great for later when I go to do some of my shadow washes uh, because I get to enhance those little cracks in the dirt and uh, they make a very interesting and cool effect. You can see also here, this is the area that I've kept pretty flat for my figures. Uh, these are the areas that I had built up. Um, there is a very different type of texture from the other um, uh, from the other uh, wall ceiling uh, texture that I used over here compared to the dirt. And I like that different blend between different textures. The dirt shouldn't feel like, the ground shouldn't feel like it's all the same texture. That is a little bit of organic change between one area and the other. And you can see I'm doing little swirls here. The swirls are definitely helpful for breaking up the paintbrush effect where it feels like it streaks rather than rather than the swirls. Doing one last look over everything, make sure that uh, it's evenly covered, that there isn't any streaks, that I've covered the area nicely and that I'm happy with uh, the result of how this all looks. Uh, this is now the second layer and the second layer now needs time to dry. At that point, we're gonna go in, I'm gonna do a few other highlights with a slightly lighter color. I'm gonna mix some white in with this color just to give it a bit of a very highlighted surface area in some of these areas. Um, and then my following stage after that is going back through and hitting up some of these shadow points where all these crevices are it's going to help kind of do a wash and uh, I'll show you how that mixes next. I'm going to be mixing up a slightly lighter tone that I'm going to put over the top of the surface. One more layer for the sand desert floor. I just want something that's going to act as a pure highlight to this. So what I'm going to be doing is adding some white paint with my floor base top color. And I'm also going to add in a slight tad of a warmer kind of uh, a um, uh, color that's getting close to the color of the walls. The walls are a slightly different color than the floor itself. Uh, the idea is that the ground is a lot more dirtier, it's been stepped on a lot more. And you can actually see that within the movie of uh, A New Hope. And you can see that the ground is slightly more scuffed up. So when I'm mixing paints, it's always important that you start with the lightest color first. Uh, if you start with a dark color and you add the light to the dark, it takes a whole lot more white to actually get it lighter. The idea here is that you pour a little bit of white into your bucket. And then what I'm gonna do next is add little splotches of my dark color. Now, you don't have to add a lot of your darker color to your white. Uh, it only takes a little bit, and if it becomes too light, then you can always add more dark. But as I said, it's actually harder to get it to look darker. Yeah, it's harder to get it to look lighter by adding more and more white to your darkness. So a good little mix here. And I can see that the light color is already affecting what I'm looking for. It looks almost white, but there's a slight warm color to it. And I do want to add one more extra color 
I'm going to take a little bit of this color here. And again, I'm just going to take a little bit. Don't need a lot. And I'm going to add it into my paint here and create a slightly warmer So you can see I really didn't add enough in there. I'm going to add a little bit more from that color. And let's try that. At the end of the day, I still want to be well lighter than what this color is right over here. That have a different grade of color into it. Uh, I'm also mixing up enough because I can use this same highlight on eventually for the walls of the of the uh, uh, cantina walls and other areas in the desert sand there. So if I have a look at this, it is much lighter than the original color. Uh, it's probably about the level and the tone that I want it to be. And uh, I'm ready to use it on my uh, paint. So you can see that this next layer of paint is now dry and it's ready for my added additional highlight. Now, again, I'm going to use this even more minimalistically than I use this one here. I'm only looking at adding highlights onto the largest, highest surface areas. I'm going to get, get once again, my block of wood. I'm going to do the exact same thing with the dry brush. I'm going to dry brush it in there get rid of all the excess and very lightly do little swirls over the surface, catch some of these highlights. And I can break it up. I don't have to cover the whole surface area. I just want to be able to cover some of these highest points. And again, be careful not to do any streaks. The streaks will really show up. Uh, little swirls really help in areas like this. Just be careful not to get too heavy. I just happened to do that right here. I got a little too heavy and uh, I'm gonna go back into it a bit later and, and darken some of that area back down again. So this is it. This is the three layers that I've got covering over the top of the entire model. Uh, these three layers, um, the base color, the secondary layer, and the highlight layer all have a bit to play in creating the, the look of, of what uh, this final sand coverage will look like. Uh, there is still two more layers to go. There's a shadow wash and a final highlight. Uh, and the shadow washes are designed to go into all the darker areas, the little tiny cracks uh, along the edges here and just help enhance those areas. And uh, the final highlight is to push some of that back. Um, and with that stage, we will be done. This next stage, we're going to need a couple of plastic cups, a cup of water, an empty cup, and uh, the darker tone paint. Now, I said I picked this up for a reason. This is going to become my deep shadow wash. And I kept it in the brown tones for the desert uh, sand. Um, and it's going to help fall into those little cracks and crevices that I want to. So I'm going to actually experiment with this first. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of the brown paint into my cup. Don't need a lot. Just a little bit. And I'm going to pour some water into the cup. And I'm going to mix it up. And I want to have something that is extremely runny. If you can have a look there, the drips that are coming off of this is what I'm looking for. It wants to be dripping at a consistent rate, almost like milk. I'm going to add just a tad more water. 
So yeah, it wants to be a milky consistency for, for what I need this to be. Now, now that I've got it mixed up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to test it out on the painted area of this block of wood. And you're going to have two small paintbrushes, one slightly wider, one slightly narrower. Uh, the, narrow, the wider ones are going to be for water, and the narrow one I'm going to use in the paint itself. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just draw a little line just to experiment. While it's still wet, I want to use the water come into one side and try to bleed it in. The goal is that if this was a crack on my model, that it would blend out and fade out. So you've got a darker edge with a watered down wash that comes out into the, uh, into the uh, rest of the dirt there. And the idea is just experiment, just practice with this sort of brush, uh, go through, you can make your lines kind of really thick, you can make them thin, you can play around with that. So let's just say we make a really thick line there that goes to the edge. And I want to bring on the other side. Uh, another trick with this is once you've splashed your larger brush into the water, get rid of some of your excess. It shouldn't be that wet that it becomes too runny. The idea is to do a soft edge along that one side, blend it out, and you actually end up with kind of a crack-like surface. And you can go in there. This actually is a technique that you can use for if you wanted to paint marble onto a piece of wood, you could do the exact same thing. And it seems that this is a little bit light, and sometimes it helps to go back into the original paint. You can always add back little areas of even darker. And this actually helps when it's a bit more dry, but you can actually see that I'm adding some additional tone and additional shapes. And it doesn't follow the highlight, the, the main, it doesn't follow the main full line. It's just in little areas where I want to highlight the darker a little bit better. And that's the experimentation of how that's going to work. So again, I'm going to follow along. Go through, demonstrate again. Go through with a brush with very little water on it. Soften one edge. Now let's just say I want to soften an entire area. I can go in and darken an entire area. I can actually go back into that area and soften it again. As long as you make those edges blend in nicely trick is just to experiment and see what you've got there. So this is what I'm going to be working with on the surface of the actual model, um, giving myself a few darkened areas. This is extremely dark for the model. Again, the additional highlight I'll be doing at the end will help push some of this back so it doesn't become so intense. And you'll see the difference in the final video. Now that I have the chance to demonstrate how I'm going to do the painting technique, I am actually going to do that on the model. And again, I'm looking for these crevice areas that I want to do something with and help enhance a little bit. So um, I find it uh, best to have a little tray to put my uh, paints in. I'm going to keep the one with the water. I want to get rid of some of the excess paint. Okay, so I've got my brown paint. I'm going to go along the edge and I'm going to give myself a little bit to play with. You can't let this go and set too long, otherwise it will end up by drying out. So you've got to hit it while it's wet. The moment that a line is too dry, um, then you end up with a streaky mark from the paintbrush. And it's really pretty easy. It's really just going along, having a look at areas that you want to enhance, go through and then soften the edge with the paintbrush. And if you make a mistake, you can always, while it's still wet, dip it 
your paintbrush into the water and excessively wash it back out again. And any areas that you deem uh, a little too soft, you can go back in with the original paint and put little dabs in there. Still soften it out a little bit. Adds a few extra weights in turn there. And this is just basically a soft wash blend. And you can start to see it starts to take a bit more shape, a bit more form happens. And you don't have to go into every single crevice. In fact, it visually helps if you don't. Um, it's just really just in areas and it allows that breakup to happen a little bit more. And you can see as it starts to dry, it's still pretty intense. And that's what my final dry brushing is gonna be over the top. The dry brushing is gonna help push this back a little bit further. Um, so it's not such a heavy, line of, of events in there. I always find painting is a very therapeutic, relaxing environment for me. Uh, keeps it uh, stress-free, especially painting miniatures. I, I've uh, painted miniatures all my life since I was a kid. Uh, when I used to paint little Dungeons and Dragons figures and um, build my own miniature models uh, when I was a child. Um, I actually went through several phases. I started off by learning, self-teaching myself when I was about nine or ten years old. I'd build miniature Star Wars spaceships for the toys, for the action figures, uh, out of paper mache. And then I expanded on that and started using balsa wood as my main source of uh, design and construction. And eventually uh, transferred up to creating cardboard miniatures. And, uh, and I always find that cardboard in the end is, is the easiest uh, product to use. You can get different forms, variations, thicknesses, strengths of cardboard. Um, and uh, it, uh, it does uh, it does evolve your uh, your vision of, of of what you can do with it. Um, it's really about uh, what products you've got next to you, what you can use, um, things like that. So I've got the areas covered that I feel are uh, needing of coverage. Uh, I'm very happy with this result. This is now stage number four, uh, which is the shadow wash level. Um, and uh, as you can see, the shadow washes are a little bit heavy in areas. That's what the final highlight is for. And it's going to help blend it back on that final uh, highlight. I do have to wait for this to all dry. I don't want anything water or liquidy uh, coming through into the final paint texture layer. Otherwise it just gets muddy, messes up and, and blends in and disappears. So uh, let's go to the next stage once this is dry. We have reached the last stage of the painting, which is the final texture layer. Uh, again, I've pulled out my highlight paint um, and uh, the block of wood that I'm using. I'm going to do the exact same technique I did before, which was tipping the brush into the paint, getting a lot of the excess off of the brush, and then going over the areas that I've actually ended up by shadow washing into just very lightly to help push them back just a little bit more. And what it does is it softens the dark wash that's in there, uh, 
keeping some of those extreme shadow points uh, marked, but at the same time softening it enough that it feels like it's all part of the one blend. At this stage with the model, um, this part is ready to go on to the next step, which will be building the foam core walls, which I'm going to be building for the rest of the cantina. The final little bit here is just getting those last remaining areas covered with the highlight, pushes them back. And uh, the next stage will be to build the actual walls themselves. And again, you don't have to go too heavy over the top. It's just enough to get rid of the washes and knock them down a little bit. You still want to see some of that wash coming through. And at that point, once you are satisfied with your coverage, and you feel that you've got the right set of tones going through it, then you are done. You can see here in these final stages of the transformation of how this particular model ended up by uh, starting off the textures, the layers, how I built up the paint layers, and how the final result ended up. And you can see the transformation here. Um, hopefully this kind of gets to uh, give you an idea of uh, the length of time it actually can take to put something like this together. Um, but uh, it's rewarding. You have uh, just started off on the building of the desert sandscape for Tatooine. Um, and this works with a lot of other techniques as well. So you've made it through this far into the video without falling asleep. Congratulations. You've taken the first steps into a larger world. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. I will be continuing the next stage of this video in the coming weeks, where I'm going to be building the extension height of the walls out of foam core, showing you how to build and put that together, how we're going to texture it, and uh, how we're going to add some probably some little LED lights and things like that to it, as well as some of the other background settings for this environment and then we will be able to install the entire piece once it's completed. So please join me for that, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you.